If you love to be remembered as the person who gives the best birthday gifts, I'm here to tell you that 1-800-Flowers.com is your ultimate birthday gifting destination. 1-800-Flowers has thoughtful and artfully created options that are guaranteed to deliver the best birthday surprise. Shop thousands of unique gifts at 1-800-Flowers.com for exclusive offers and great values. To order today, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. Warning, the profanity in this episode contains adverbs and conjunctions and shit. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Adam and Eve, Manscaped, and by the new beverage choice for idolaters, Golden Caffeinated Soda. Because sometimes you get tired of the king of the juice. And now, The Scathing Atheist. If there's one thing I've learned from listening to The Scathing Atheist, it's that babies are delicious. And that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's February 3rd. And it's for Chaplain's Day. Yeah, because why stop a bullet with a Bible when you use the guy who handed it to you? <laughs> no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Joe Rogan's, New Jersey, okay. Ann Arbor, Michigan, and oh. across Georgia, this <laughs> is The Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, we buy the Hillsong Church a brand spanking new domain name. Christianity leans all the way in with their ignorance is strength motto. And we welcome back the most dangerous Ford since the Oregon Trail. But first, the diatribe. I wish I could access a log that would show me how many hours I've spent since we started this show incredulously Googling a story, discarding one credible source after another because the story I'm reading about cannot possibly be true. Now, granted, it doesn't happen as much since the Trump era began, but because there's only so many times you can say this is too stupid to be true before you stop believing yourself, but it does still happen. Case in point. The high school kitty litter box panic of 2022. So here, here's how I first became aware of this. Lucinda still maintains her old Facebook profile under her real name. I gave that up in favor of my No Illusions profile years ago because y'all are so much better than my family and my old friends from high school. But she continues to live this double social media life so that she can keep up with her friends, kids and shit. And of course, she grew up in South Georgia and North Florida. So between those updates on the kids is pretty much just a wall of Fox News paranoia and Trumpian drivel. Now, professionally, this is very useful for us. She stays way more plugged in than I do to what the batshit crazy Christians are up to. So I have a great barometer of just how fringe some of the shit I read about in the atheist media is, right? It's, it's also why it caught me all the way off guard when she said, have you heard this nonsense about the kitty litter boxes in high schools? And then I spent the next 90 minutes furiously Googling more information and then asking Google how sure it was that The Onion hadn't changed its name to Texas Monthly. But it hadn't. Turned out they hadn't changed their name to Right Wing Watch or Reuters either. This shit was true. So here's what those ridiculous idiots are afraid of now. According to multiple sources, including congressional candidates, we'll get to it. Schools in America are now adding kitty litter boxes to the public restrooms for students who identify as cats. Now, that is not real, right? Schools are not doing that. And even the most casual of Googles will confirm as much. All it takes is high school kitty litter to bring up multiple reputable sites and USA Today refuting this asinine claim. But of course, fact checking isn't a strong suit for the MAGA crowd. So Lucinda had multiple gullible ass conservative Facebook friends unquestioningly sharing bullshit propaganda sites seriously making this claim. Now, as, as near as I can tell, this all starts with a somewhat careless story from an NBC affiliate in Kentucky. The story is about a Louisville grandmother who started a petition to get students at the local school to stop dressing and acting like cats. 
a petition that the school superintendent assures parents is as necessary as a petition to get them to stop having like old timey pistol duels or something. But the article doesn't get to that part until the end. They devote the first eight fucking paragraphs to a completely credulous presentation of the grandma's story, which is that there are students calling themselves furries going to school wearing cat ears, tails, collars, etc. And I'm going to quote the anonymous grandma here who will, quote, hiss at you or scratch you if they don't like something you're doing, end quote. Of course, eventually the story admits that what really happened is that a few students went to school wearing cat stuff, got in trouble for violating the school's dress code and had to stop doing that. But because this fits so perfectly into their dumbass slippery slope argument that they love to make about trans acceptance, it caught fire. And now many of the MAGA influencers are running with it. And and to make the story work, of course, they can't admit that the kids were told to leave their tails and cat ears at home. So it grew into schools accommodating the furries by installing litter boxes in the bathrooms for those students to shit in. Now, the, the latest claim in the saga is that a school in North Austin is lowering some cafeteria seats so that their furry students can eat directly from a bowl without needing, you know, utensils. They just stick their face in there like a dog or a cat. And this claim comes from a tweet by a candidate for a congressional primary down there. Guess which party? The, 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 this forced a representative of the accused school to put out this amazing statement where she points out that the like the seats of their cafeteria can't even be lowered. <laughs> now, when asked what the fuck she was talking about by local reporters, she said no comment. And then apparently still hazy on what that term means, added a comment about how she was just relaying information she'd received from a concerned parent. Now, think about that shit. That's her defense. Her defense is that she just accepted a patently absurd claim that no reasonable adult should even be mentally capable of taking seriously and then passed it along on social media without checking its veracity. The key requirement of a congressional representative, of course, is to take in information from diverse sources, things that you're not an expert on, weigh competing viewpoints, and then make decisions through one synthesis of that information. Admitting that you bought into an onion-esque conspiracy theory and didn't even bother to Google it before passing it along is about as disqualifying for congressional office as any non-crime I can think of. But unfortunately, that doesn't matter when your voting block is entirely made up of people who also shared this stupid fucking story without a fact check. Or let me give their stupidity all the benefit that it's due despite doing a fact check. Of course, whenever I marvel over this kind of thing, I have to remind myself how much practice these people have being afraid of shit that doesn't exist. Right. I, I mean, we're talking about people who grew up fearing the rapture and burning in hell for eternity. In many cases, those are the fears they continue to hold. These are the same people that brought us Comet Ping Pong, QAnon, the Satanic Panic, subliminal messages and rock albums, bans on dancing, witch trials. And th this is this is inevitable. Right. It's baked in. In order to belong to their fucking club, you have to promise to fear a non-existent thing above all other things. And at the same time, you have to at least pretend not to be afraid of death, which is one of the few things you should actually be devoting some fear to. Getting fear ass backwards is one of the defining attributes of being a fucking Christian. And let's face it, in both of the aforementioned instances, you can't think about things too hard before coming to the conclusion that you're wrong. So the fact that they're disinclined to fact check their fears seems inevitable as well. Now, obviously, but this mindset is fraught with problems. I'm sure you don't need an exhaustive list of why it's bad to fear non-existent shit. But in addition to the anxiety they manufacture for themselves out of whole cloth and the time they spend tilting at windmills instead of working on real problems, we also have to remind ourselves how easy it is to manipulate frightened people. Anybody who lived through 9-11 and, and saw how quick we were to jettison decorum, morality, and common fucking sense to assuage our fear of terrorism will know that well. But at least terrorism was a concrete thing. At a certain point, we could wake up as a society and realize that the fears that there are terrorists around every corner were unfounded. And to a certain degree, we eventually did. Right. We, we backed off of at least some of the worst reactionary shit we did in the wake of 9-11. But that can't happen when your fears are imaginary. Imaginary problems that are conjured into existence without evidence can't get better. I mean, I think about it. After thousands of years of war, God is no closer to conquering Satan. 
Because the people who are creating the fear are also the people who are using it, and it never stops being useful. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the phosphate group and nitrogen containing base to my five carbon sugar molecule, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to nucleotide the listeners over? <laughs> That's right, listeners. <laughs> that was the final clue in our ARG teaching you how to make crystal meth. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the drug would be acid if he was telling there us how to make a drug. There you go. <laughs> and speaking of illicit drugs, I need a break. So we're going to pause for a word from this week's first sponsor, Adam and Eve. Hey, podcast listener. One of the great things about being an atheist podcast is we don't have to beat around the bush when it comes to Valentine's Day. That's right, Noah. And that means we can tell you with no reservations that the best Valentine's Day gift for your sweetie is fuck stuff. That's right. Fuck stuff. Stuff to go in your butt, mostly. Stuff to go in your other holes. Outfit stuff. There's so much fuck stuff to choose from. And there's no better place to get it than adamandeve.com. But Noah, what's adamandeve.com. They're the number one adult toy superstore. And when you go to adamandeve.com, you can select almost any one item for 50% off with our code scathing at checkout. Maybe get a really big dildo. Some nipple clamps. Or a Harry Potter costume that Eli had me mention so that it wouldn't seem like the one he brought up. Traitor. But that's not all. When you select your one item, you'll also get a free Valentine's Lover's Kit that includes a cock ring, a vibrator, and a loop sample, plus six free pornographic movies for your viewing pleasure and free shipping. So head over to adamandeve.com and be sure to use the offer code SCATHING. Again, that's S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G, SCATHING, because without it, there will be no free Valentine stuff. That's offer code SCATHING at adamandeve.com. Fuck stuff. It's the gift that keeps on giving till your back hurts. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, co-founder of the Hillsong Mega Church and Media Empire and leading contender for the national title of crock of shit Dundee if Australia ever gets around to reading my fucking emails, Brian Houston <laughs> has stepped down as the church's leader amid allegations of covering up child sex abuse. He's taking this move at the request of both Hillsong's board and their legal counsel, though as near as I can tell, he's going to continue to get paid every bit as much. And since his wife, the co-founder of the church, will continue in her leadership role, I don't really think he's given up a whole hell of a lot of control either. Of course, if symbolic and meaningless lies and half-truths about leadership and power bothered his Christian congregation, they wouldn't be a Christian congregation. Mm -hmm. So a quarter measure appears to be more than enough for them. Yeah. Also, he looks like Jerry Sandusky's profile photo on LinkedIn. <laughs> now, I know there's no such thing as looks like a pedophile, but uh, maybe there is. If, maybe, if, we, if, maybe we check a little harder if there is maybe that. Yeah. He looks like the author's photo for a book called You Need More Money. <laughs> well, because he is. Yep. He wrote that book. He <laughs> wrote a book called You Need More Money. That's an actual title. Yeah. So the accusation at the heart of this is actually against Brian's late father, Frank Houston, who died in 2004. He's alleged to have, quote, indecently assaulted a young male in 1970, end quote, which has always struck me as a strange phrasing because it seems to suggest that there's a decent category of assault. <laughs> right. I feel like. Maybe illegal accusations shouldn't give the perpetrator the benefit of euphemism. Anyway, <laughs> court documents suggest Houston, the younger, knew about this shit all the way back in 1999 and failed to disclose that to police. Again, weird legal phrasing here, quote, without reasonable excuse. And okay. well, what the fuck would that be? I don't know. Sorry, the sun was in my eyes. so <laughs> I Didn't disclose it. See, this is why I own IWillFuckYourDad.com. MyDadWillFuckYou.com. A lot more sinister. Right? A lot more sinister. Yeah. Eli, you, you bought MyDadWillFuckYou.com and forwarded it to Hillsong Church's website, didn't you? I sure did. No, I sure did. I yeah, knew you checking would. It. Yes, he did. Yep. Hillsong, which is based in Sydney, but has churches in almost two dozen countries and like 30 in Australia alone, gained international notoriety through its popular worship bands. And of course, I'm using popular in the most relative of senses here, but it's been plagued by controversies over the last couple of years. They've been caught bilking government programs meant to help Australia's aboriginal community. They promoted a dude who pretended to have cancer so he could later be miraculously healed. They've been accused of cult-like behavior that leads to church volunteers being treated like slave labor. They were accused by a student at one of their Bible colleges of really dragging their fucking feet when she reported a sexual assault. And they repeatedly violated Australia's COVID-19 policies back when Australia was still trying to avoid the pandemic. They're also the church that just Bieber and Chris Pratt belong to, which isn't like gross. 
technically a scandal, but it kind of should be. <laughs> because like, how the fuck is he going to sound like Mario? It makes no goddamn sense. God, he's the worst Chris ever. Yeah. Fucking Chris Benoit is a better Chris. I hate him so <laughs> Christopher much. Christopher Columbus, better Chris. Right, yes. Genocidal Chris's are better. There's a guy who does Mario's voice. He's yes. a cartoon. You could do a cartoon right. with the Mario. Guy. Charles Martinet, guys, he's alive. He ain't super busy. That's a me. That's that doesn't take him that long. He's got free time. Anyway, get him. There are a couple of reasons that it's worth emphasizing this story that are unrelated to the upcoming Mario film. The first, obviously, is that a lot of people seem to think that child sex abuse cover ups are just kind of a Catholic thing, but the Catholics just keep better records. Yep. Right. Like child sex abuse and covering it up is inevitable whenever you put people in authority over children with no government oversight whatsoever. Yeah. Really wish that wasn't a thing. But it, yep. Yeah, we, we, we have to operate like it is because it is. <laughs> but the second is that it's an important reminder that, you know, while there are certainly more and less dangerous religious messages, they're all dangerous. You know, even the fluffy, non-denominational, inclusive, mega church, self-help plus Jesus stuff is dangerous as hell because lying to people about how Earth works and then claiming authority based on that lie cannot be done harmlessly. And the fact that even many atheists seem to think that it can will never cease to amaze me. <sighs> and in give me library or give me death. Well done, sir. Thank you. If you ever listen to our show and think, was it always like this? It feels like it wasn't always like this. Let me assure you, you're not crazy. And while this podcast serves as a damn good record of what Christians always wanted, in recent years, they've gotten a hell of a lot more bold about it. And we got another reminder of that this week when Ridgeland, Mississippi mayor and man who looks like he's only mayor because golf course groper isn't a thing you can run for, <laughs> Gene McGee, <laughs> tried to hold back part of the public library budget this yes. week uh -huh. until they agreed to get rid of all the gay books that offend him. <laughs> really? Hey, Gene... How did you know we had a whole bunch of gay books at the library? I was I was searching for book comma gay because I hate that. It's <laughs> public safety. You are. I was <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Smoke yeah. bomb. <laughs> so according to library systems administrator Tonja Johnson, quote, he explained his opposition to what he called homosexual materials in the library that it went against his Christian beliefs and that he would not release the money as long as the materials were there, end quote. And if you're wondering what Gene McGee thinks homosexual materials in the library are, so is he, okay? I read three interviews with this guy. Nobody seems to be able to get a clear and definite answer from him what the gayness of particular pieces of paper are. However, he has concretely objected to a book called the Queer Bible, which, again, very much according to the sources I read, he obviously thinks is a Bible for gay people and not a collection of essays by queer people Jesus. about the queer experience. Oh, Jesus. It's super sad that name's taken, though, because like this story makes me really want to write a gender swap Bible where all the characters are LGBTQ and... And now I have no idea what to call it. I know it's taken. <laughs> Maybe the Gene McGee Bible. Yeah, there you go. So then Miss Johnson, who, if we ever start some kind of like secular sainthood thing, is a strong contender, by the way. She tried to explain how, you know, any of this works. Quote, I explained that we are a public library and we serve the entire community. I told him our collection reflects the diversity of our community. He told me that the library can serve whoever we wanted, but that he only serves the great Lord above. I end quote. The fucking mayor. I feel like there are others. So, okay, here you go. Here's a solution. He walks in. Every book has been swapped out with a copy of Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. Now, the good news is, of course, there, there are ways around this asshole because he's a mayor. <laughs> That's not a thing. The library board has already taken this to the board of aldermen who approved the budget in the first place. Basically, the mayor like signs the check as a ceremonial thing, but they don't, they don't need him to no. sign the check. So this is all going to work out fine. And even if it doesn't, the city would stand no chance in an actual lawsuit. So it's not a problem because the library is going to lose funds. It's a problem because McGee, who has been mayor since 1989 in this town, Jesus. thinks that he can do that. <laughs> 
I love that Tanya Johnson was like, hey, uh, Mayor Jean, the check doesn't turn into a fucking pumpkin without your magical ink wand. <laughs> so I have the, we're buying so many gay books now for Spike. You're so right. Every activity Tonya schedules for the next 12 years. Next up in headlines, <laughs> we have yet another new contender in our ongoing homicidal liar tournament. And her name is Sherry Tenpenny. Rapper named Dimebag. She is not a rapper, by the way. Not yeah. at all. And shockingly, she's not a cobbler in a Dickens novel either. No. So <laughs> <she's not. laughs> I'm sure it's going to be one or the other. But she is a Christian right anti-vaxxer activist who somehow testified before the Ohio House of Representatives. Makes me feel a little bit better about moving, honestly. Yeah, then I read about a, a candidate for Michigan governor saying that Pregnant rape victims need to have that baby because it's good optics for Christianity. Mm -hmm. So, ah, maybe New Zealand's next. I don't know. Sorry, I'm getting off track. We learned something new about the COVID vaccine from Sherry Tenpenny last week. It's going to turn people into transhumanist cyborgs. And uh, honestly, I'm fucking psyched about that. That sounds amazing. Well, like, yeah, who the fuck is against transhumanism? Like, I mean, if if we're giving the shit away for free, right? Like, like I, that would be like somebody opposing va va vaccination. I got there eventually. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> my bad. Sorry. Now I'm just picturing Sherry jogging after everyone who has rocket feet. Now she's just like, I love my natural. Oh, sorry, I got long COVID. So many disadvantages <laughs> right now. Oh. Yeah, so <sighs> here's a quick background on Sherry Tenpenny. First of all, she's an osteopathic doctor of not epidemiology, no. which means she's a real doctor. Plus, she knows about some fake stuff, too. And again, not an epidemiologist. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Also, she's appeared on Charlie Kirk's podcast. Despite his face thing, she was able to do that. <laughs> and she's been a speaker at multiple stops on the Reawaken America tour. That's the lecture circuit of Homicidal Liars, organized by Clay Clark. And he looks, he looks like he looks. Physical appearance is, it's not important. We'll just go right past it. It's Honestly, no, deal. we should just throw away the counter. It's not doing anything. I, I didn't point. paste a picture of Clay Clark here. <laughs> I, do, I, I don't know why you would mention the, the counter would not change right now. Nothing happened. <laughs> Nothing happened. Or it did, it would change. I, it would move. If you're counting days where I don't say it's, you know what I mean. Okay, moving on. <laughs> just in case there's any remaining confusion about Sherry Tenpenny's scientific credentials, she was mentioned as a source of information in the anti-vax documentary Plandemic that we reviewed. Mm -hmm. But she was only mentioned a little bit. She's on the anti-vaxxer JV squad, is yeah. what I'm saying. Right. Well, she, she also told the aforementioned Ohio legislature that COVID vaccines would leave you magnetized such that a key would stick to your fucking forehead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then she did not go on to try to prove that to the people she was talking to. Yes. Uh -huh. Which is such a bummer because her just like, eh, right. let me push her out. I don't know. Maybe she did. Maybe <laughs> she did. We don't know. So <laughs> Maybe. Here's what might get Sherry Tenpenny a shot at the varsity team. She did an appearance on the Stu Peters show recently. And physical appearances matter. So we're going to talk about Stu Peters because... He looks like the act of yelling wrist control was a human being somehow. <laughs> yeah. He looks like he's never bought a piece of clothing that wasn't described as tactical. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Tenpenny is talking with that guy and she said, quote, the stated goal of the COVID vaccine is to depopulate the planet. Well, who stated that as the goal? <laughs> <Go fuck yourself. laughs> yeah, right. Continuing. And the ones that are left after that depopulation, the goal is to make them chronically sick or turn them into transhumanist cyborgs that can be manipulated externally by 5G, by magnets, <laughs> by all sorts of things. <laughs> End quote. Interesting. Oh, it's a good thing Stu Peters viewers were warned. Otherwise, they could be easily manipulated. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little weird that they're still going with the depopulation theory, right? Because they know they're depopulating at an awesome rate yeah, all by themselves. Yeah, right. They're winning. <laughs> Trying to beat so, us to it, maybe? I don't know. You're probably wondering at this point, okay, but what about the phenomenon whereby a pair of particles are generated in such a way that the individual quantum states of each are indefinite until measured, and the act of measuring one determines the result of measuring the other, mm -hmm. even when at a distance from each other? Mm -hmm. From the goodness to another, yeah. Great, great, great question about quantum entanglement. The answer is... Menanglement. Also, go fuck yourself. She will say the words <laughs> quantum entanglement, but it won't be helpful. According to Tenpenny, quote, 
the whole issue of quantum entanglement and what the shots do in terms of the frequencies and the electronic frequencies that come inside of your body and hook you up to the internet of things, the quantum entanglement that happens immediately after you're injected, that's the end of that sentence, apparently. Really? <laughs> Continuing. <laughs> You get hooked up to what they're trying to develop. It's called the hive mind. And they want all of us there as a node. Well, they want the ones that don't die in the genocide, the population right. thing at the well, beginning, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Continuing. They want us as an electronic avatar that's an exact replica of us, except it's an electronic replica. It's not our God-given body that we're born with. Fuck it. And all of that will be running through the metaverse okay. that they're talking about. Mm. All of these things are real, Stu. All of them. <laughs> it's not some science fiction thing happening out in the future. It's happening right now in real time. And <laughs> exact quote. Okay, so Sherry, there are a lot of things that you legitimately have to worry about, especially since you're not vaccinated against many of them. But nobody's coming for your mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Speak for yourself, Noah. Sherry Tenpenny's consciousness forever drowning in a vat of urine is how the metaverse gets my dollar. So. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm in for a dollar too. And apparently everything I just mentioned was part of her testimony for the Ohio house. That was last spring. I believe <laughs> Jesus. She actually started this whole rant. I just mentioned by saying, Everyone made fun of me for being a crazy person when I testified in Columbus, Ohio. Yes. But this is real, what I'm about to say. <laughs> so, to be clear, she's too crazy for the Republican Party of Ohio. <laughs> Not great. Bottom line, here's the big takeaway. It's time to buy some IOTA coin and hodl that shit. The IOT <laughs> in IOTA coin stands for Internet of Things. And D A Agent Smith and... The hentai robots are not going to be able to get paid efficiently without IOTA coins. We all know that. Stock up now. Honestly, if Neo had fought hentai robots, Matrix 2 would have been way better. Okay. Like, way. And, and Didn't he? Lest we fall into the trap of listing things that would have made Matrix 2 better for 16 hours again. We're going to take a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. Was he not fighting hentai robots in Matrix 2? A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey! I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. So, yeah. Heath already mentioned it briefly in his headline, but it looks like Twim is going to open up in Michigan yet again. And whereas last week we had the awesome story of Jex Blackmore given anti-abortion activist nightmares by taking a pill live on the evening news, this week we have a misogynistic candidate for governor trying to sweet-talk women impregnated by rapists into carrying the pregnancy to term. So, the fuck biscuit in question here is Garrett Saldano, a chiropractor by trade, so already pre-disqualified for public office. But as if his simple existence wasn't bad enough, he recently went on the pompously titled Real America's Voice to tell anti-mask idiot April Moss that women who are raped should be thankful to God if they get pregnant. After all, that child might, by his estimation, be the next president. And the kid's dad, in my estimation, might be the last one. But yeah, he literally said that shit. He started off by telling the story of an adopted friend researching his birth mother, and learning that she was gang raped on a subway. That's absolutely not true, by the way. No fucking way he could have researched that shit. Anyway, he goes on to talk about how happy his friend was that he got to live instead of not live. And how grateful he was that his mom hadn't gotten an abortion. And if Saldana realized at any point that the implication was that his friend was also grateful to those gang rapists, his face never betrayed it. Of course, Sedano didn't want to take a hardline approach to encouraging rape victims to bear their attacker's children. Instead, he's advocating for the getting people to fight fires for 32 grand a year approach and suggested just calling them heroes. Quote, how about we start inspiring women in the culture to let them understand and know how heroic they are and how unbelievable they are, that God put them in this moment and that they don't know that little baby inside them may be the next president. Maybe the next person that changes humanity may get us out of a situation, maybe in the future. We don't know that. End quote. In other words, why can't those greedy bitches look on the bright side of their rape? Of course, as friend of the show, him at Meta points out, he never bothers to balance that alongside all the shit that the victim might be if she didn't have to go through a pregnancy and become an unwitting mother. 
I guess she never had the situation getting out of potential of her unborn man child. <sighs> anyway, on that depressing note, and with the hopes that we can move on to some other state next time, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines in Caps Lock News, but lock with an E. <laughs> Tennessee pastor, COVID denialist, family embarrassment, and diabetic in training, Greg Locke took a break from screaming at service workers about mask mandates long enough to organize a good old-fashioned book burning. For real, though. You know, like no single person who isn't universally recognized <laughs> as a historical villain did. Automatically evil. Right. Yep. Any time. He justified the event by citing chapter 19 of Acts and pointing out that, quote, we will not tolerate witchcraft and we will not be <laughs> compromised with devil worshippers. End quote. All right, guys. So I was reading this book about this really great flamethrower team. They're doing public <laughs> safety work. They're burning evil books for public safety. Then some asshole they hired just stops doing his job out of nowhere. <laughs> Guy Montag or something. It's a good book. We won't burn that one, but we're burning most of these fucking books because they're evil. Side note, that witchcraft passage, great if you're ever arguing with anyone about the Bible because... Either witches are real or God wants you to kill everyone in Seattle with an undercut. And it's, it's really <laughs> either way. It's a problem for them. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the first announcement came during a sermon last Sunday where Locke told his parishioners to bring Ouija boards, which he described as, quote, portals to hell, end quote. Sure. And which is parishioners would presumably have to like purchase. Right. Unless they are in the <laughs> habit of just leaving portals of hell around with their board games and of course to keep things topical he added harry potter and twilight stuff as well cool oh jokes on you greg you accidentally burned mormon abstinence propaganda yeah, so. right right exactly <laughs> Locke described the so-called burning service in more detail the following day on facebook where he added quote and i'm sorry for such a long quote but it's fucking greg lock every word of his is delicious quote we're not playing games Witchcraft and accursed things must go. Bring all your Harry Potter stuff. Laugh all you will, haters. I don't care. It's witchcraft 100%. All your Twilight books and movies, that mess is full of spells, demonism, shape-shifting, and occultism. Bring tarot cards, Ouija boards, healing crystals. Huh. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna burn crystals, apparently. <laughs> He's going to be so mad. Why won't this part burn? It's so much. Can someone give me a bellows? For days. <laughs> anyway, continuing the quote. Idol statues, spell books, and everything else tied to the occult. It's got to go. If you think we're crazy, scroll on. We're exposing the kingdom of darkness for what it is. It's time for people to be delivered. End quote. Okay. Okay. So uh, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, got an idea, and I did some checking. I went on Zillow right next to Greg Locke's church <gasps> in Tennessee. Heath. There is a 1.5 acre lot. Heath. It is selling for $18,000. Oh, oh, shit. We can raise that. We need to buy it. We need to construct a giant Ouija board the size <laughs> of the building <laughs> and start doing portal to hell stuff. Right next to this oh, like weird blue lights and evil chanting. Shed. Yes, I love it. There's we are so doing much. that. We could Patreon goal listeners. Patreon goal. Eighteen thousand dollars. And we can. That's we not that, that much. We can do that. Legal question. Always a bad start. If you made a totem out of sumac leaves and you sent it to Greg with a note, that oh says, Jesus Christ! <laughs> Please do not burn my very special witch totem. <laughs> Is it still? Murder. To Eli, don't. <laughs> what did we say about asking? Is it still murder <laughs> on the air? Yeah, and may I say, Greg, I just personally, like as an author, I can confirm that we really deeply care about what you do with our books after you pay us for them. That like it, it matters to us on an emotional level that just rings with us for eternity. So, might I suggest that you add a couple of copies of Outbreak: A Crisis of Faith to your Kindling list? A book which not only contains a mess of spells, demonism, shape-shifting, and occultism, but also points out what an asshole you are by name. If any book deserves to be burned by the dozens, nay, hundreds, it would be Outbreak, A Crisis of Faith, How Religion Ruined Our Global Pandemic. Maybe you'd burn a few Kindle copies, too. That would really show me <laughs> that. <laughs> and in Oklahoma news, the Oklahoma State Senate took a look at the 
obvious bat shittery of Mayor Gene McGee this week and asked our nation to hold their proverbial beer as they filed a bill SB1470, which says, quote, No public school of this state shall employ or contract with a person that promotes positions in the classroom or at any function of the public school that is in opposition to the closely held religious beliefs of students. End quote. (laughs) That's so stupid. Okay, so Oklahoma just accidentally declared Lord of the Flies at the public school. (laughs) No more adults. That's impossible. You can't have that rule. This is going to be fun. Well, I love it because like they're they're trying to make it sound neutral in the phrasing as they always do because they kind of have to, but there's no way to do that without accidentally emphasizing what a batshit crazy privilege they're asking for. Right? Yep. It's like it's like how publicly declaring that you think a wife should be okay removing something stuck in any of her husband's orifices <laughs> doesn't throw anybody off the scent, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I deleted that Facebook status in confidence though. I mean, for me, it just seems impossible that they don't see how this is going to go wrong for them, right? right? Aside from the obvious, I don't think we can hire any science teachers who teach science now problem, even by their own Christian theocratic worldview, they've now created a law where a Muslim student can sue the district if a football coach prays on the 50-yard line, and they super de duper want to do that shit. Yes. Yep. Right. Okay, so if we have any listeners in Oklahoma with kids in public school, and I'm assuming you and your kids closely hold the belief that Christian teachers who don't punch themselves in the face every five minutes are evil, I want you to send us an email because we're Mm -hmm. working on a potential lawsuit. We're going to do a test case. There you go. Or fuck it, go full door mamu and tell them that you're offended by their religious beliefs not being offended. Ooh. (laughs) They can't prove that you're not. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But this bill actually gets worse. As we've said before, the point of bills like this one is to encourage nuisance lawsuits, right, that will harass school districts into compliance, which is ironic because we've literally watched a dozen Christian movies over on our sister show, God Awful Movies, with the reverse premise where Mm -hmm. the non-religious person is doing the suing and they're the bad guy because of it. Anyways, as such, they've put injunctive relief of $10,000 into the bill for hiring someone who disagrees with students' deeply held beliefs. Wow. They've put a $10,000 bounty on any school district that disagrees with its craziest parents. Okay, cool. Whoa. So they earmarked some money for that lawsuit. We're going to be yeah. good. Good stuff. <laughs> and we promise to donate that money to the charity of your choice if we pull this off, or we'll use it to buy that parcel of land next to Greg Locke's church for the Ouija board. That'll get us real close. Prank yeah. war thing, one or the other. Two you can make those. that at your charity if you want. Hell yeah. And finally tonight, in Christian freakout news, a guy ate some toast with peanut butter. Anna? What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. Christians are freaking out after an ad being run in Australia by the matchmaking site eHarmony depicted a man being given toast with peanut butter by another man. (gasps) Oh, I wonder what they think that the peanut butter represents. <laughs> Sitting at home. Now, wait just a darn minute. That feller's curing that other feller's COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so you're probably thinking, yeah, Christian people are ridiculous. But how much of a freak out could that possibly be from just toast with peanut butter? Well, I have good reason to believe it's at least one million people who had a serious <laughs> problem <laughs> with this advertisement. Because a group called One Million Moms sent out an action alert to their entire community. And I can't imagine they just made up their title with a number that's an obvious lie. That would be stupid. We'd make fun of it all the time. There's no way that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> so here's the action alert from the leader of the One Million Moms, Monica Cole. Quote, by promoting same-sex relationships, eHarmony wants to make it clear where they stand on this controversial topic instead of remaining neutral in the culture war. And I'm going to stop the quote Right there, not reading the rest. Just imagine all the other bigot stuff you might hear in that Christian lady voice right there. (laughs) Quick version, just so you have some idea where she went with this. This is the gay agenda. A man lying with a man is a sin. 
kids are watching TV when this ad is being run. The kids are just going to start doing gay peanut butter stuff all of a sudden <laughs> because they've seen a man eating a piece mm-hmm, of toast with mm-hmm. peanut butter. Also, I would like to add, I've never had an orgasm because of God. I have <laughs> one million followers. That's not a lie. That's real for sure. Jeez. No, lady, I, I see how you get confused here, but there is no controversy here. Okay. Everybody agrees it's GIF when you're talking about the peanut butter. <laughs> See, that one I like to pronounce as GIF. I like to keep people on their toes. No, I'm, you're Hitler. So I'm pretty sure eHarmony was very intentionally trying to trigger the religious bigots. And I love that. Good job. Yeah. yeah it worked. But they did it with some subtlety, which is very confusing to religious bigots. The two men in the commercial did not proceed to have graphic gay sex after the toast in the ad. No? But I'd say it's heavily implied because they seem like a really good couple that fucks a lot after they have breakfast. Like, that's their normal thing. They get into it after breakfast. So that was fun. One other fun detail. They had one of the guys wearing a comically oversized dangling earring with (laughs) a Christian cross on it. Nice. So, good stuff by eHarmony. I enjoyed that. (laughs) Damn it, jewelry that tacky belongs in the climax of our Christian romance movies. How dare you (laughs) sully it, sir? (laughs) And now I'm in the mood for peanut butter toast and sex with a man, so I guess we're going to have to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Don Ford will be here. No comment on whether that's related to the uh, sex and peanut butter thing. None of your business. Noah, you wanted to see me? Yeah. So, look, we have an ad this week from an old sponsor, but I feel like it's better that just you and I do this one. Really? Why? This sounds bad. It's for the company that makes, um, you know, like grooming tools aimed for men. Oh, yeah. yeah. You mean Manscaped. Sorry. <laughs> Manscaped. God damn it. He, it they just bought one spot as a trial. What up, knuckle fuckers? It's me, the Manscaped Man, back just in time for Valentine's Day to tell you all about the Performance Package 4.0 Peak Hygiene Plan. That's right, take your lawnmower 3.0 and throw it in the fucking garbage, because the 4.0 will shave you so smooth, she'll think she's having sex with a dolphin. A sex dolphin. I hate this guy so much. But don't spackle your crackle just yet, because the Performance Package 4.0 also comes with Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer. Crop Preserver Anti-Chafing Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Ball Spray Toner, and the Magic Mat Disposable Shaving Mat. Those can't all be real. Oh, they're real, all right. Plus, we're going to throw in a pair of Manscaped Boxers. Anti-chafing boxers at a $20 value for free. You'll be so silky smooth, she'll think you're a cleverly disguised child and kill herself like that guy from To Catch a Predator. There it is. There's the refund. Yep. Head over to Manscaped.com and enter code SCATHING at checkout for 10% off your order and 100% off your sack. Guaranteed. Still giving the promo code, really? You, you Manscaped. When the fear is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Okay. Uh, God, Manscaped Man has cost us so much money. Yeah, it really has. Just a lot. What the fuck is an evangelical? The term evangelical comes from the Greek word for gospel, evangelion, which sounds way cooler than gospel or evangelical. According to the dictionary, the term simply means of or denoting a tradition with Protestant Christianity emphasizing the authority of the Bible, personal conversion, and the doctrine of salvation by faith in the atonement. And as concise as that definition may seem, it does beg the question, are there traditions within Protestant Christianity that don't emphasize the Bible, personal conversion, or salvation? And if you asked an evangelical, they'd probably say yes and lump all such traditions under the heading of mainline Protestantism. But if you asked a mainline Protestant if their religious tradition emphasized the authority of the Bible, personal conversion, and salvation, they'd almost certainly tell you yes. So clearly, someone's full of shit. And we're talking religion here, so odds are it's everybody. Now, if you trace the term back to the 16th century, it was largely a synonym for Protestant. To find the point where it diverges into a distinct type of Protestantism, you have to fast forward to the First Great Awakening in the 1730s. In its early form, it was largely an amalgamation of the three P's of being boring as fuck at a party, pietism, Presbyterianism, and Puritanism. Rather than representing a denomination or sect of Protestantism, the evangelical tag denoted a movement within a number of Protestant sects. 
In many ways, the movement can be described as Puritanism light and grew in direct response to declining attendance and local piety in the previously puritanical cities of Massachusetts. While less cynical historians describe this as a method of refurbishing God's message for a more modern day, realists see it as a bunch of Puritan preachers removing all the inconvenient shit from their religion because they were running out of money. For example, during the Great Awakening, denominations that used to say that it took a lifetime of sturdy contemplation to achieve true assurance of one's faith started saying it was a signing bonus that you just got for saying the magic Jesus words. This do-nothing-and-get-rewards approach to religion caught on quickly in the North American colonies, but as much because of the evangelical focus on missionary work as the new low price. Unlike many of the traditional forms of Protestantism, evangelicals held a firm belief that one wasn't doing their true duty to God unless they were all up in everybody's shit about it. This led to an increase in religious influence in government, schools, and the average American social life. But like Puritanism before it, the evangelical movement became stagnant and outdated, and by the early 20th century, it was dominated by fundamentalists so fundamentalist that they actually called themselves fundamentalists. A desire by some more PR-conscious members of the movement led to the term neo-evangelical in the post-World War II era, which we now simply call evangelicals. So, Yes, the swath of Christians that include Pat Robertson, Brian Fisher, and John Hagee started with an effort to be less fundamentalist. Of course, knowing where the evangelicals have been doesn't get us much closer to understanding what the fuck they are, especially since the history of the movement is largely defined by what they're not. And modern evangelical groups are of no more use as their primary goal is to make groups of people they represent seem as large as possible, even if that requires using rather fuzzy definitions. For example, the World Evangelical Alliance claims to represent more than 600 million evangelical Christians worldwide, which represents about 195 percent of the total evangelical population. They get there by employing the Bebbington Quadrilateral, which you can tell is full of shit because they didn't just call it the Bebbington Square. They did a five-syllable word in there to make it sound thinky. Basically, this approach defines evangelicals through their theology. It posits four key theological elements, and in the tradition of overnaming laid down by gratuitously polysyllabic use of quadrilateral, they define these four elements as follows. Biblicism, the belief that all essential spiritual truths can be found in the Bible. Crucicentrism, a focus on the atoning work of Christ's death on the cross. Conversionism, the belief that human beings need to be converted. And activism, the belief that the gospel needs to be expressed in effort. If anybody strongly agrees with all four of these statements, the NAE considers them an evangelical. The problem here, obviously, is that you're going to catch a lot of fish in that net that would vehemently disagree with your classification. Hell, by that definition, you can find an awful lot of evangelical Catholics. Even further confusing the definition is the tendency of the modern media to use the term evangelical as a shorthand for white Protestant, which is all the more baffling since WASP is already there and takes way less effort to say. So despite looking into the etymology, the dictionary, the history, the organizational definition, and the demographic definition, I wound up back where I started. See, to me, the term evangelical simply means extra annoying non-Catholic Christian, and the more I dug into it, the more I realized that truly was an operational definition. In other words, an evangelical is a fundamentalist with enough PR savvy not to use the F word. And if you like it, you give a heart. You just like tap and then there's okay. a heart. But where's the home screen? I don't, I don't oh, understand where that's you start. The, there isn't a home screen. You just you just keep swiping and you, liking you, you things. You just keep swiping like forever? Uh, I mean, yeah, technically. It doesn't feel great. Yeah, it's, it's probably not. Right. Eli, if you're done explaining TikTok to Heath, it's time to do Bible Peace Theater. Right. Yeah, the part of the show where we act out the Bible. New book, Second Kings, right? That's right. So, uh. Um, and I would like to announce that Don Ford, voice of fantasy and adventure, is here. Hello, Don. Oh, thank you for the introduction, Heath. Thank Welcome. you very much. No, it's great for the, uh, rhythm. So, wait, we're, we're going to start with the story of King Ahazia. And Elijah. Ow! Ow! Servant! Uh, servant, come here! Come quick! Yes, my lord. I fell and I hurt myself. Go ask Beelzebub if I'm gonna be okay. Uh, yes, my lord. Um, where did you injure yourself? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't, it doesn't really matter. Well, well you know, he might ask. So, right, okay. You know, if... Uh, so, so I was doing yoga. Naked, a naked uh -huh. yoga, and and then I got hungry for a salad. Of course, right? I'm very health conscious of, as I am, and and so the kitchen sent up a butternut squash for me, 
oh. uh, to eat in my, in my salad. Oh, uh, you know what? You know what? I'll, I'll just go get the answer pop then. Yeah, you do that. And, uh, servant. Uh, yes. Yes, Your Highness. Hurry, it's way up there. Oh, yes. Yes, Your Highness. Lou, 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 doing Elijah stuff. Elijah stuff is my favorite stuff. Yo, what up? Ah, oh, the smell. Hey, angel of God, what's up? Listen, King Ahaziah sent messengers to Beelzebub to ask if he's going to get better. And that is not cool. So I need you to go intercept him and tell him that the real and only God says he's going to die. And don't do that. Okay, you got it. I'll, I'll send them. Oh, and also ask if he's done with that squash. For God or for you? I just, I don't see why that matters. Just do what I said. Yeah, I'm going to stick to the first message. It's fine. Fine. It's a waste of a squash. Are you drinking buffalo sauce? Are you? No. What? Uh, Your Highness. Yes, Messenger. What news do you bring from Beelzebub? Oh, yes. About that. We got intercepted by a guy in the road... And he told us to tell you that you're going to die. Hmm. Uh, this guy, uh, was he hairy? Or did he have girded loins? Like, like, girded? Well, yes. Honestly, um, it looked like he was wearing an apple as a belt buckle. Yeah, that's going to be Elijah. Tell you what, take some soldiers and tell him to take back his prophecy or else. Oh, yes, your highness. That dude's junk is terrifying. Oh, Yes, so much so. Thank you. Men of God, men of God, come down so that we may take you to the king. Um, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down and bakoom you guys. Nice. Dude, you, you, you go. Okay, I'm going. I'm going. Hey, um, man of God, man of God, pretty please. Please, please, please come with us so that we may take you to the king. Please. If I'm a man of God, may fire come down and book oh, guys. Oh, come on, then, please. Oh, uh, great and awesome man of God, who is super awesome and who has just the right amount of cloth around his junk, will you please, pretty please, 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 be the guest... Of the king. What do you think, angel of God? Yeah, that's cool. You should go. Your junk does look amazing, though. Right? Thank you. Like a cartoon octopus. I take that as a compliment. Yeah, like in the good way is what I meant. You wanted to see me, your highness? Yeah, Elijah, you had a message from God for me? Oh, uh, yeah. Because you asked Beelzebub for help, you're going to die. Well, yeah, you already told me that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was, so you killed hundreds of my men to avoid telling me something that you already told me? I did, yes. Well, now, I kind of feel like... <laughs> well, would you look at that? Problem solved. Wow. Butternut. Yeah, mm-hmm. butternut. So finally, the time comes for Elijah to die. Elisha. Elisha. Yes, master. You are my pupil and disciple. Yes, okay. Also, our names are so close that quite a few biblical scholars think we might be the same guy and that the stories uh-huh. just got confused. Yes, yes, also true. Mm-hmm. Come with me as God leads me on my last days in the world. All right, you got it. Elisha, how's it going, man? Oh, not bad. Just hanging out with my master, Elijah. I see. You, you know he's going to die, right? Um, Yeah. Yes, yes, I do. So, are you sure you don't want to, like... Nah, I think I'm good. If you say so. Elisha, hurry, they have a sale on batteries. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming. Wow, that's like three cities we've gone to now where people have told me to abandon you because you're, you're going to die. Weird, right? Yeah, super weird. That, that's very specific and weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, 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 you mm-hmm. want to see some god magic? <laughs> I sure do. Eh. <laughs> Wow, you split the river like like Moses. Just like Moses. Nice. Yeah. Good stuff. Good times, yeah. Mm-hmm. So before I go, is there anything I can do for you? I think I'm going to probably... Anything? Yeah, no, anything at all. I'll use my God powers. Awesome. Um, okay, I would like a double portion of your spirit. 
What does that, what does that mean? It means I want to be twice as good a prophet as you are. Oh, that's, that's nice. I, I, I guess. Right? Um, okay. Well, you know, just stick around with me and, uh, you will be a very good prophet. You I'm said sure. anything and I said twice. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, sure. Twice as, twice as good as me. Nice. This is an homage. It feels awkward to be better than me, right? As your wish. I'm just, it's right? positive. Like it has a little edge to it. It's fine. You know what? It's fine. It's fine. Oh, would you look at that? It's my chariot of fire to take me to heaven. Be, 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 be. Goodbye, Elijah. Be a good prophet. Be, 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 I will. Be, be. I'll be twice as good as you. Be, be, I promise. Be, be, be. Seriously, you don't hear that? You know what? It's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll see you. Are we sure we're good on the copyright for that? The way Eli sings? Yeah, no, we're fine. Hurtful. Hmm. I wonder if I have river splitting powers now. <laughs> nice. Uh, Elisha, Elisha. Yes, men of Jericho, what up? Uh, our water has dried up terribly. Uh -huh. Can you help us? What? <laughs> Crazy, yeah. No, I'll get right on that. Uh, go get some salt and I will fix it. Uh, you know, actually, we have salt in our bags right here. I said, go get some salt. Oh, okay, okay, right, okay. Go okay. Go we're going. I don't to do any magic. So one day, Elisha is walking along when he's spotted by some local children. Hey, Baldy, where are you going? Yeah, crumb dumb. You're going to get a haircut? All oh, right, wait. you kids. All right. All you, right, that's you enough. Suck that's bald, an, okay, bald, bald okay. Uh, All yeah, right, I well, I think, I think, I think you, that's a lot. Atheism. I think it's okay. Uh, the Clay Clark mentioned seem like a sex thing. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm pretty sure that's not in the Bible. <laughs> you can't that just part's say not. That the Four Seasons thing happened. That's not a joke. That's just repeating a funny thing that happened. <laughs> uh, okay, a li little help here, God. Uh, bears, I would like some bears, please. <laughs> yeah. Cowardice killed Coupon Craig. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Good stuff. Elisha! Elisha! I didn't feed children to bears. Uh, what? Oh. What? No, yeah, we weren't going to say that you did, man. I felt we, like you were about just, to say that. No. We're, we're going to war against Moab, but we don't have any water. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, totally fixable. Bring me a minstrel. Mammy. But no, uh, a much less problematic minstrel, please. Yes, Elijah, what shall I play for you? Oh, uh, anything at all. Uh, okay. I guess, uh, twinkle, twinkle. Whoa! God says dig holes in the desert and tomorrow they'll be filled with water. God is so great. La, la, la. <laughs> Love that song. Excellent. Thank you. Nice, man. But, um... Can I ask why you didn't just deliver that message to us? Okay, well, uh, I'll tell you why it wasn't. It wasn't because I was worried I'd shout about killing uh, children with, with bears, if that's what you're thinking. That's not the reason. You totally killed kids with bears, right? Yeah, like super obvious. Oh, yeah, okay. Clay Clark is very funny looking. Okay, okay. And now that we've reached a point of universal agreement, I suppose we can wrap things up, but we'll see you again on next month's Bible Peace Theater. Before we stick this episode in the fridge, I want to remind you that there's still plenty of time to get your tickets to Free Flow in Orlando. First weekend in March, join me and a whole bunch of other secular speakers, assuming that you're, you know, all the way vaccinated and willing to brave Florida. I understand if you're not. Look for more information on the show notes. Anyway, that's all the blessing we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half-sister show Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this would seem like a thankless episode if I neglected to thank people, so thanks to Lucy send illusions for being the love of my life he then right for being the apple of my eye and eli bosnick for being the cream in my coffee i'd also like to thank don ford in a way that doesn't really fit into that roger rabbit line i also want to thank john for providing this week's farnsworth quote uh, it would have been nice to include a recipe or two but that's fine there's no wrong way to cook them but most of all of course i want to thank this week's best people Dwayne, Phil, Philip, Bo, Andrew, I Heart Dogs, Chris, Derek, Turner, your surly DM, How Much Hog Could a Groundhog Grind If a Groundhog Could Grind Hog, Chimichanga, Arcane, Ryan, Samuel, and Z. 
Dwayne, Phil, Philip, Bo, and Andrew, whose condoms could be used to trap submarines in wartime. I Heart Dogs, Chris, Derek, Turner, and Groundhog Grinder, who are so hot they could light a candle over the phone. And Chimmy, Changra, Arcane, Ryan, Samuel, and Z, who actually are getting any younger. Together, these 15 people, statements of canine affection and gritty tongue twister reboots helped keep the bills at bay again this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some of it to us, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of our episode, or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a money giving kind of way, you can also help a ton by leaving a five star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATPod on Twitter. And then tweet at us, because Tim gets lonely sometimes. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also rolled the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. Morgan, see if you can find the noise of a butternut squash leaving an ass and then falling on the ground. Yeah, yeah. that's what we're going for. See, you should have recorded it when it happened earlier in the week. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't your face look Now red? who feels stupid? Right. <laughs> Back to the thing. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Socks are the number one most requested item at homeless shelters. Underwear second and shirts are third. At Bombas, socks were first. Made with comfortable details for everyday wearing. Then underwear and shirts too. All designed to perfectly fit. At Bombas, every item you purchase means you're donating an essential clothing item to someone in need. One comfortable clothing item for you, one donated to someone in need. Bombas, comfort for all. Get 20% off your purchase at bombas.com slash comfy. If you love to be remembered as the person who gives the best birthday gifts, I'm here to tell you that 1-800-Flowers.com is your ultimate birthday gifting destination. 1-800-Flowers has thoughtful and artfully created options that are guaranteed to deliver the best birthday surprise. Shop thousands of unique gifts at 1-800-Flowers.com for exclusive offers and great values. To order today, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in.